Welcome to Chapter 5, uh, the Periodic Table. This first section is going to review a short history of the Periodic Table and kind of introduce you to the modern Periodic Table, how to interpret it, and learn how characteristics of the elements led to a logical way of grouping the elements. So think about this. Think about going on to iTunes and everything's all mixed together. All the music's mixed together. How could you tell which ones are pop songs from the rap or the jazz or R&B? Um, how, how could you figure out what song you wanted? If the songs weren't arranged in a pattern, you wouldn't know what kind of song you had chosen, correct? So a lot of thought went into how to categorize all those songs and put them into kind of folders and groupings. Um, it's kind of like scientists in the early 1860s. They had a similar problem with the elements. At that time in the 1860s, scientists knew some of the properties of more than 60 elements. However, um, no one had organized the elements according to the, those properties that were known. Organizing the elements according to their properties would eventually help scientists understand how those elements interacted with each other. So let's get into a little bit of history of how this uniquely shaped table kind of came about. First of all, the name Dmitry Mendeleev should stick in your head. Mendeleev was a Russian um, chemist, and he was the one that kind of discovered a pattern of the elements in about 1869. First, he wrote the names of the properties of the elements on cards. Then he arranged these cards, and by different properties, such as density, appearance, melting point, um, he was able to see a pattern. He discovered a repeating pattern with those properties. And he eventually arranged those elements that they had at the time according to increasing atomic mass. He saw what's called periodicity in the table. And periodicity, or to be periodic, means happening at regular intervals, um, a regular repeating pattern. For instance, the days of the week are periodic. They repeat in the same order every seven days. Um, similarly, Mendeleev found that the elements properties followed a pattern that repeated every cell of seven elements. His table became known as uh, the periodic table of elements. So there was a lot of pattern to it. If we look at his original periodic table, you notice that it was it just looked like a table. It didn't look like what we have today. Um, Let's zoom in here to group one. You notice that group one, and he spells group a different way, he was Russian, um, has a formula underneath. It says R2O. Now R just means um, you can substitute R for what element you're talking about. So if you look in this column for group one, you see there's hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium. Um, he had copper in this column, rubidium. He had uh, silver and some other elements. Um, this, the, the formula on top, R2O, was how that element reacted to oxygen. So the two shows you that you needed two of that element to react to oxygen. For instance, hydrogen's in that column. He knew that you needed two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen when you made, when you made water. Also with lithium, you needed two lithium atoms to react to one oxygen atom. They all had similar um, formulas. Elements that were in the same column reacted to oxygen the same way. If you look at group two, you see that the formulas are O. What he noticed was all the elements in that column reacted to oxygen in a one-to-one -one ratio. And that went on. And that was one of the clues that he had to arrange them into the columns. He also, if you notice, put them in order of increasing atomic mass. And remember, the mass is the protons plus the neutrons. So he, he placed them um, in order of atomic mass. Now you see, for instance, right here in group three, that there's a blank. In group four, there's a blank. He knew what the mass must be, but there was a blank because he didn't they didn't discover that element. So he kind of left it there, but he kind of knew what properties he was looking for. But he came up with the periodic law, and the periodic law states that the properties of the elements are a periodic function of their atomic mass, meaning that their atomic mass increased in order, and a lot of the properties were very periodic. Every eighth element, you started repeating that pattern again. And you'll see what I mean as we go along. But um, 
there is a, a pattern to it. Every time you get to the eighth element, it kind of repeated and started over and you ended up grouping elements together according to their properties. As you can recall, um, the periodic table has those two rows that are on the very bottom. And I told you maybe in a chapter or two before that we actually have arrows that kind of tell us to go from 56 down to 57 and across that row in the bottom. And then when we get to 88, go down to 89 and across that bottom row, the lanthanide and actinide series they're called. Well, if we were to take those two bottom rows and kind of shove them into the main table, it would push everything to the um, right hand side and make our periodic table really really wide and a lot of people say well why didn't they just do that why didn't they just shove those two rows into the main table well if they did that it would make it very wide and it's really kind of silly because of wall space and in different rooms and stuff they they literally couldn't get it in textbooks it was too wide for you know to to place on walls they just wanted to put them down um, on the bottom because a lot of those things were man-made. They weren't discovered when most of the elements in the top part of the table were discovered. So they left them underneath. But if they were to put them in, it would just make it really wide. So that's just kind of a little fun fact for you. There was a lot of gaps in Dmitry Mendeleev's periodic table. Um, he, remember, he arranged it by atomic mass. Henry Mosley was his student in his lab, he's probably a PhD student. He kind of looked at what Mendeleev's table looked like and he kind of rearranged it because there was a lot of gaps and they just weren't satisfied with that. So they rearranged it. Henry Mosley rearranged it according to atomic number, that's the number of protons in the nucleus, and it worked. A lot of the gaps were filled in, all of the properties were still in their same columns, all the trends were still working out and it worked and that is how our modern periodic table looks now um, in, in order of an increasing atomic number. So the modern periodic table has the elements classified into three categories metals, nonmetals, and metalloids and they put these in those three categories according to their properties. Now you're also going to learn that the number of electrons are going to be very important in the outermost energy level. This is called the valence and that's going to help us determine which category these elements are also going to belong in. The zigzag line also helps you find where the metalloids are and how the metals are located on the left hand side of the zigzag and the nonmetals are located on the right hand of the zigzag. Each element is identified by a chemical symbol, you already know this, and each square of the periodic table contains the atomic number, the atomic mass, the symbol, sometimes it's the average atomic mass, so it'll be a decimal. Um, the chemical symbol for each element usually consists of one or two letters, you know that, the first is capitalized and the second is not. Rows are called periods and columns are called groups.